So that was a, a look at Spring Show's tool suite and a look at Maven and a look at you know how to get a new uh, application started. But I don't think we came here just to to get a taste. Let's actually build something interesting, right? Let's actually build a, an application. Whenever I build an application, I usually start in terms of my domain objects. I start in terms of the problem I'm trying to solve, right? And so I encourage you to do the same. Again, Spring makes it dead simple to start modeling your problem in terms of the domain that you've got and then to add on layers, to layer on the extra features that you need, be it a persistent service, be it data access, be it uh, some sort of web user interface, and so on, right? That all comes naturally based on the uh, core that is your domain object. So let's go back to Spring Source Tool Suite and actually sort of build an application that manages uh, our domain object, which in this case is a customer object. So here's my customer object. It's a simple little POJO, nothing particularly special about it. No, you know, it just manages state. It's got a couple of fields on there, and that's it. And I know that I want to be able to manipulate data corresponding to my customer domain object, right? I want to be able to actually uh, ret retrieve information from a database in this case. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, one of the more popular ones is to use the Java Persistence Architecture, or the Java Persistence API. I'm never sure, but it's, it's one of those two. And when I do that, I typically do it in tandem with the service. So I'll build a service, and then I'll use the Java Persistence API uh, to work with my data in terms of the object model, and not in terms of the underlying low-level uh, rows, databases, and columns, and so on. So you can see here I've got a class in Spring that is picked up by the Spring Framework. It's, at, it's got add component on it, so this bean is automatically registered uh, with the context, and then Spring introspects the class itself and looks for all fields that require a dependency, right? They, that require a reference to some sort of bean. In this case, it'll see that you've got a dependency on a persistent context. The Entity Manager from JPA is the centerpiece application. It's a centerpiece API that you'll use uh, to talk to JPA, which in turn talks to your database for you. It makes it very easy to, you know, to actually get your data from a database in terms of your objects, right? You notice that we don't have any, this is just fundamentally very simple code. We're saying I want to get a customer class and I want to return it, I want to find the one that has the ID matching this value. Uh, and this all gets, you know, this is all very easy to configure. But the first thing to note is that in order for customer POJO to be persistible, we have to add some annotations. So you can see I, uh, I've had that. To make that work, I've had to add that, which is an ID telling JPA that I want this class to have that primary ID. Uh, and I've had to add that. You can see I'm taking advantage of Spring Source Tool Suite's quick uh, editing capabilities. That class is now persistent, right? So I can actually, this code will work now correctly. This is a great option. Um, and you can see that the entity manager is pretty critical here to make this actually work, right? This is the whole, this is the part that we need. Spring injects that for us based on configuration. So let's actually take a look at the configuration for that uh, entity manager. This is a Java-based configuration for our JPA service, right? Again, a very simple service because we're just trying to demonstrate a point, but this configuration class uh, is a Java-based configuration class. There are, of course, as we established, alternatives. You could have done this in XML. You could have done this you know, with uh, component scanning and so on. All we're trying to do here is provide a definition for, for our data source here. right? So we're using Spring um, to just use an object. We're just creating an object. We're configuring it. And then we're returning the reference to the context. And then we're creating a local container entity manager factory bean. And that's the object that's responsible for uh, providing our entity manager. That's the one that actually automatically handles getting references to our entity manager. And it, in turn, needs a reference to our data source, right? So it's, we're invoking the method down here, and that is injected, if you will. It's configured on the, on the entity manager factory being here. Nothing startling and it very much in line with what we've talked about, but just so you know, that's the configuration, if you will. You will only usually write one of these classes, and you can add, you know, any number of services. You don't have to do a configuration class per service or anything, obviously. This is just one configuration class, and you can have a thousand services or a thousand objects that require references to these data sources and any managers. 
and of course, our uh, our client is uh, well. It's nothing to write home about because it's just so simple. <laughs> There's no magic here at all. It's just an applic application context, and we're telling the application context that we want to get the configuration information from our configuration class, and then we use the application context to get a reference. You know, this is more like a test. It's not actually a proper test case, but you can see that all we're doing is exercising the configuration and testing it. We're getting a reference to the customer service class and then using it to actually retrieve our object by ID. And then we're printing, printing out the results. I don't have to you know, use a special framework for anything. This is just works, right? Clean, simple, and uh, very apparent and transparent. So the Java persistence architecture is one way to go, of course. But again, uh, important to drive home the point that the Spring framework is all about choice. It's nothing if not about choice. Right, and so while the Java persistence architecture is a great choice for a lot of applications, some people may feel more comfortable with other persistence technologies like uh, JPA and uh, like, sorry, like Hibernate directly, or like Data Nucleus directly, and uh, JDO and and uh, JDBC. Right, there's lots of alternative technologies out there, and actually another one's uh, my iBetis or MyBetis. Right, so let's look at that same customer service, that same use case. And instead of uh, using JPA, let's actually use JDBC. So first, here's our implementation. The implementation, as you can see, has got a little bit more code uh, than the JPA implementation. However, uh, for those of you who have used JDBC before, you'll know that this is actually a very stark little example. I mean, there's, this is almost nothing, right? This is one method. You can see what it's doing. Um, it's returning a record of type customer uh, based on the query, right? So you can see that the JDBC API is certainly more focused on the lower level rows and columns, you know, interface of the database itself. It's certainly more low level than JPA, but Spring makes it very, very easy to achieve, you know, very, very smart and very clean code even still. For those of you who have used uh, JDBC, you'll know that most of the code you'll write in JDBC is you know, T and boilerplate code. It's the stuff that you don't want to have to ever write again, you know, more than once. It's session acquisition, connection acquisition, uh, transaction creation, and so on. And then uh, reams and reams of try catches for exceptions that you couldn't hope to handle anyway. And then uh, session destruction and connection destruction, you know, or return to the pool and all that. There's a lot of code that you don't want to write. And, you know, in keeping with spring spirit of uh, making it easy for you to write the code that's important to you and then letting the framework handle the rest, Spring provides what are called the uh, template objects, right? This template object here in, in particular is the JBC template, and this is a Spring Framework API. This API uh, provides, it's a, it embodies a pattern that you'll see uh, in the rest of the framework all over the place, right? The use of template objects to hide and inflate the really kind of boring code that you don't want to write anyway. So here, we're using the template object to query for just one record, which is why we're able to return directly, right, because we're, we're, it's type safe and it's going to return to a type of customer. Uh, and it's going to get that run record by executing this query, which has a parameter. Uh, and then for each row in the result set, in this case just one, but you know you could actually call query instead of query for object and you get multiple records. Um, it was going to call this row mapper. This is a callback class, right? This is a class, this is where you actually tell Spring the specifics of your use case, right? This is how you, this is the part that you really care about uh, doing. This is not something that is boring or team. This is actually the, the, the only part of the whole thing that you see here that's specific to your business and to your requirement. Everything else you don't have to worry about. Finally, the last parameter is a var args, right? So you can have any number of parameters here, and that corresponds to the positional arguments in, in the query. So the first parameter here corresponds to the first question mark, the second parameter to the second question mark, and so on. This row mapper uh, is just an interface, and when you use it, Spring iterates through the result set and calls the map row method on this and gives you a chance to do whatever you need to do to provide objects in terms of your domain model, right? So here's how we're actually getting our customer objects this time. Very clean, very you know coherent, and you can see it's very simple. You know this map, this is clean and reusable as well. This row mapper implementation. I've extracted it and put it as a little private class here, but uh, you could just as easily do it as an anonymous inner class if you know that you're not going to ever need to be able to map that particular of the type of entity back. And that's a very appropriate use case, right? A lot of people use JBC for uh, for 
so-called one-off type things, or perhaps uh, you just have a, a simple interaction with the database and you need to make it quick and make it work. A lot of people use JDBC also to get access to the more, you know, to the tuning that you can do in the raw database and perhaps leverage business logic that you might have stored in the database, right? All these are options and it's entirely your prerogative. That's the whole point. We make it very easy to use any technology you want. And this is no more obvious than in the JDBC template. And again, the, uh, the client that exercises it is the same as before. So we saw that the customer service is actually depending on the JDBC template, just as we did uh, in other places. And again, that implies there's some sort of configuration in place. So here's our JDBC configuration, just as before. It's the data source, and then we have a JDBC template object. Instead of the local container entity manager factory bean, we have a JDBC template that returns a data source, that, that requires a reference to a data source. So very simple, no extra cost, no extra complexity. It just works. 